Hello, my name is Sean Paul Kowchuk, and I want to talk about the Temple and Tabernacle. I grew up with the Sabbath and the Holy Days of Leviticus 23 and Deuteronomy uh, 16, and I grew up with the Queen Meats of Leviticus 11 and Deuteronomy 14. But in 2011, toward the end of 2011, I started to really I started to embrace the Hebraic side of things, with, which has been life-changing. And I want to share some of the things about the tabernacle that I've learned uh, that I hope will be inspiring and help you to understand why Torah is so important. Uh, one of the things about the tabernacle that you read in Hebrews 9 it says in, in uh, Hebrews 9 23 it says therefore it is necessary for the copies of the things in the heavens to be cleansed with with these but the he heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these for Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself to appear in the presence of of God for us. Uh, and it talks about him offering himself and how the priest would have to go in year by year offering blood for themselves and many things like that. And the uh, then we we go down to number uh, to verse twenty seven. It says, "And inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes the judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear sins of many, will appear a second time for salvation, without reference to sin." those who are eagerly await him. We should be awaiting him in the holy place as it talks about in Hebrews 10 where it says that uh, in verse 19 therefore brethren since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil that is his flesh and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere, uh, with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So, <laughs> like it says, the holy place. That's the the holy place of the tabernacle and temple is about sanctification. You get one of the things about the temple that you should understand is the outer court is justification. The inner court is sanctification. The holy of holies is glorification. I'm going to go through how, kind of how these work. Out, the outer court is about judgment. That's what the the animal sacrifice was all about was uh, grace because it's grace to not end up in judgment and it says of uh, Yeshua that like John said behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world well what did they offer on the, on the altar so many times lambs and goats and sh and <laughs> <coughs> all sorts of uh, things like that you know all sorts of livestock bulls goats sheep those sorts of things and why one of the things that you see in, in a lot of the sacrifices is that you have the the lobe of the liver and the two kidneys 
burned on the altar along with the fat that surrounds those in particular uh, burned on the altar and, and that's because that's where symbolically the sin was put because you when they sacrificed an animal they put the their hands on the head of the animal and confessed their sins symbolically transferring the sin to the animal just like our sins are transferred to Christ and uh, as the animal was burnt on the altar so Christ was sacrificed Christ was crucified and like it says in uh, Isaiah 53 that he he was by his stripes we are healed and um, so many things like that that by his stripes we are healed uh, and the different things that he suffered and that he took he, he was silent silent before before Pilate uh, so many things that you can read about there and uh, part of Isaiah 52 and Isaiah 53 and Psalm 22 I'll talk about the Messiah uh, and that relates to the outer court the burnt offering and then we have baptism which is the the labor represented by the labor things you you'll <laughs> also know realize that, uh, are, are one of the things to, to understand is that all the outer court stuff was made of bronze or bra uh, copper which represented judgment you had the altar and the labor and the bases for the the bases for the uh, poles that held up the the curtain were all made of, of bronze and the the <coughs> the pillars that were <coughs> at, between the outer court and the inner court all had bases of, of bronze of copper represents judgment and then you had silver at the top of the the pillars and at the bottom of the the inner court the, and the holy of holies that was those were in sockets of silver you read all this stuff in exodus 25 through 30 which one of the things to re understand about that is that and in that whole thing is exodus uh, 33 read in Exodus 33 about starting in verse 15 then he said to him if your presence does not go with us do not lead us up from here for how then can it be known that I have found favor in your sight and and I and your people it is not by going with us so that we is it not by your going with us so that we and I and your people may be distinguished from all the other people who are upon the face of the earth the Lord said to Moses I will also do I, I will also do this thing of which you have spoken for you have found favor in my sight and I have known you by name then Moses said I pray you show me your glory and he said I myself will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim the name of the Lord before you and I will be gracious and to whom I will be gracious and I will show compassion on whom I will show compassion 
But he said, You cannot see my face, for no, no man can see me and live. Then the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by, by me, and you shall stand there on the, the rock, and it will come about while my glory is passing by, that I will put you in the cleft of the rock, and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take my hand away, and you shall see my back, but my face you shall not see. That hand, first you have to understand that God is a consuming fire, which is a concept you kind of see in Exodus 24 and several other places, but I'll use Exodus 24 only for now. It says, The glory of the Lord, verse 16 of Exodus 24, The glory of the Lord rested on the Mount, Mount Sinai. The cloud covered it for six days, and on the seventh day he called to Moses from the midst of the cloud and to the eyes of the sons of Israel. The appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire on the mountain top. And this whole concept goes throughout this throughout that. You you also see this concept of the consuming fire also in the sea of glass in Revelation. Uh, Revelation 15 verse 2 and I saw something like a sea of glass mixed with fire and those who had been victorious over the beast and his image and the number of his name standing on the sea of, of glass holding harps well what happens when you ha explode a nuclear bomb it creates green glass especially like it, you can go to the Trinity site and you will see green glass all over the place because the heat was so intense that it melted it melted the uh, the sand into a glass that's part of the way glass is made is melting the silica sand into glass but that intense heat which you also see uh, that concept of everything burning you see that in second Peter 3 you uh, you see that concept second Peter and we'll actually refer to more of this later but the part that pertains for the moment is but the day of the Lord this is starting in verse 10 but the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up uh, since all these things are to be destroyed in this way what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and, and godliness looking for and hastening the coming of the day of, the, day of God because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will make out with intense heat but according to his promise we are looking for new heavens and the new earth in which righteousness dwells which could refer to the tabernacle the temple because the the, the gold represented purity and the the pillars were were wrapped in gold which is symbols of righteousness and if we are the pillar if we are the boards symbolized by the boards we have uh, imputed righteousness he wraps us in Christ in his righteousness that's how we can be in the presence of the father and like it says things will uh, burn with intense heat well God is a consuming fire I believe that's what it's talking about at some point the veil will be removed 
you will read in Hebrews 12. The last verse of Hebrews 12 says in verse 29, Our God is a consuming fire. Okay? Which I believe that's why you see in the outer court where you have the burnt offerings because it represents the consuming fire that is Yahweh. It says those are not to go, that fire is not to go out. And it, it was there to consume sin, which was the whole point of the outer court was to t show us the wages of sin is death. And the outer court is all about judgment. That's that's why justification is important. But, so we accept Yeshua through that. Then we go to the inner court. Through the veil, as I mentioned from Hebrews 10. That Christ's flesh is the veil. Through which we enter in. We enter and we have are given access to the holy place. Which is his first coming. We, we get access to the holy place at his first coming. And then the holy of holies, which is the, the throne room of Yahweh. We get access to that at Yeshua's second coming. When he comes for his bride. Like he says in John 16. I go to prepare a place for you, but I will return. That has to do with the Jewish wedding. And that's the whole point is... We get the outer court, which is judgment. It's the sea, it's the... And the inner court is kind of like the land where you can build a temple, tabernacle. Um, and you had Noah's flood, the first judgment, and then the fire, like you read in Second P Peter 3, about the elements burning I believe that's when the second veil is removed that where we will enter the presence of Yahweh after we are changed according to 1 Corinthians 15 so the outer court is about judgment that's important to understand that's why it's given to the Gentiles who are the Gentiles they are the non-Hebrews non-Israelites I believe that's why scripture says, do not measure the outer court, for it is given to the Gentiles, Gentiles being non-Jews. That's why I believe it, it is there, and it's the court of judgment. And Christ is the veil, right? Christ is the veil, and where do we see that protection, a protection from judgment? We see it back in Exodus 12 about the, as part of the Passover. And realize that the Passover came before the law was dealt <laughs> done. And the Holy, it's about the law being written upon our heart as the inner court. But the outer court is judgment. And like you see the things that happen with in, in Exodus you can read Hebrews I mean uh, Exodus 6 verses 6 and 7 where you read about the the different cups of the Seder which are all about the redemption you know that we are redeemed and you see the different plagues that he made a distinction between Israel. Like for instance in Exodus 9 verse 4 it says, But the Lord will make a distinction between the livestock of Israel and the livestock of Egypt, so that nothing will die of all that belongs to the sons of Israel. He will make a distinction. That's, that's a key point. Uh, Exodus 17, uh, 7, no, Exodus 8. But on the day, verse 22, on the day I will, 
On that day I will set apart the land of Goshen, where my people are living, so that no swarms of flies will be there, in order that you may know that I am the Lord. I am in the midst of the, of the land. I will put a division between my people and your people. Tomorrow this sign will occur. Okay, so we see that there was a there was a distinction between the two. That's why we go to the inner court. That's why the inner court is so important. The outer court is about judgment, uh, and it relates to this whole thing of where Egypt had received these plagues. You also see a lot of these plagues repeated in Revelation. You see some parallels. If you study it, you will see parallels. And uh, only, and then you read in Exodus, uh, nine, verse twenty-six. It says, "Only in the land of Goshen, where the sons of Israel were, there was no hail." And then you also, when it comes to the plague of darkness, but the, it, it will tell you that the Israelites had light. That's in Exodus 10. Read in, in verse 23. They did not see one another, nor did they, nor, nor did anyone rise from his place for three days. But all the sons of Israel had light in their dwellings. Uh, so we see there yet again. He separates the house of uh, the of uh, he separates Israel from the Egyptians, just like he separates us from the rest of the world, from the Gentiles, those of us that are grafted in, according to to uh, Romans 11 about being grafted in it says do not be do not be arrogant toward the natural branches for if they were not spared neither will you be if you turn away so this is outer court that this is related to the outer court and let's go to this part that the Israel in my opinion what make, part of what makes Israel is read, pray, and obey. What are we reading and praying? And what are we obeying? The Word of God. And why we can read, as far as prayer, go read in Proverbs, the book of Proverbs, uh, Let's read in uh, Proverbs 28, verse 9. He who turns away his ear from listening to the law, even his prayer is an abomination. That's an important part. Even his prayer is an abomination if he doesn't follow Yahweh. Uh, and then let's read here in Proverbs 15, the, the, verse 8, the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. But he loves the one who, who pursues righteousness. Grievous punishment is for him who forsakes the way. He who hates reproof will die. There again, outer court judgment. And But he hears the prayers of the righteous. Well, read, pray, obey. We read the word of God, we pray, and obey is a key part of that. That's how we become a light. You know, this being an oil lamp there's oil in this oil lamp.
but it doesn't do any good unless I light the, the wick, right? So it is with us. If we don't obey, we're as useless as the lamp is at the moment. But when we obey, our wick gets lit and we become light to the world. Uh, and that's very significant. What, what did Christ say? I'm the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness. And we can read in Psalm 119. Let's read in Psalm 119 real quick. A couple of things while I'm there. Psalm 119 says, one, verse 105, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. What is the menorah? A lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path, so to speak. And the inner court is the journey. The outer court is we say yes to, to the Father by accepting Yeshua and understanding that it is only through Him that we have salvation. And how do we enter the inner court? We enter through repentance. So it's a light. It, the word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Then you read in uh, 165, those who love your law have great peace. What is peace? Shalom. You can read several places in, in John about abiding. That's what this. That's what the inner court is all about: is abiding in Him. And you, you will read about love. I mean, you, lo, loving your neighbor as yourself, and and it, uh, James talks about submit to God, sum, submit to God, and resist the devil, and he will flee from you. That's the whole point. As we enter this inner court of read, pray, and obey, that's where we see changes. That's where we, uh, where the rubber meets the road. That's where we escape the outer court judgments. The outer court is about judgment. Just like it, they were judged in, in uh, Egypt, but it, Israel was set apart, and we'll read that here in a second. But let's we read First Peter one verse twenty two. Since you have an obedience to the truth, truth being Torah, purified your souls for sincere love of the brethren, for love one another from the heart. For you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable. That is through the living and enduring word of God. Uh, so we see those things. That's what the inner court is about, is this concept. You read throughout First John all about this concept of abiding with Him. And we, we here's another thing on prayer. First John 3, verse 22. And, whoever we, and whatever we ask we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing in his sight. That's important. That's inner court. Doing the things that he asks. Read, pray, obey. And that matters because if we go back to Exodus and the Passover, what happened? Of course, the beginning of months, but so we see that uh, then we read in verse 3, Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth day of this month, they shall each one, each one to take a, they are each one to take a lamb for themselves according to their father's households and the lamb for each household. And it talks about how if the lamb is too much, you have your neighbor in, but here's the here's the part where it applies to the tabernacle, in my opinion. 
and, and the tenth tenth of the month first of all the tenth tenth of the month is important that's when the triumphal entry happened where they were saying Hosanna 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 it was about uh, but we read in verse five the uh, your your lamb sh shall be an unblemished male a year old you may take it from the sheep or from the goats you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel notice congregation it, it exists back then of Israel is to kill it at twilight moreover they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses in which they eat it they shall eat the flesh that that same night and ro roasted with fire and they shall eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs do not eat any of it raw or boiled at all with water but rather roasted with fire both its head and its legs along with its entrails and then burn the rest of it and talks about how you observe the Passover but that that happened before the law was given that's outer court from the outer court through the blood of the lamb and why was the blood applied to the to the door I think that's parallel to where it says in in Hebrews 10 that Yeshua is the veil his flesh is the veil his flesh is the veil the blood that protects us from judgment just like what happened here in Passover the first Passover they were to put the blood over and apply it to the door and then like let's read here in verse uh, 22 uh, and you know it talk, verse 22 it says you shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood which is in the basin and apply some of the blood that is in the basin to the lintel and to the two doorpost. That's important. And the fact that we are temple of the Holy Spirit, that's that's what happens when we apply the blood of Yeshua, when he becomes both our Lord, our Savior and our Lord. Our Lord is him being our Lord is how we enter into the Holy of Holy the holy place. We read, we pray, and we obey. Because Hebrews 5 9 talks about his salvation to those who obey him. That's why this matters. He is salvation to those who obey him. And you read Acts 5 32. It says, We are witnesses of these things by the Holy Spirit, which he has given to those who obey. The Holy Spirit is given to us. Uh, uh, the more we work in the inner court, the more the Holy Spirit is given to us. And, the, and it's part of our journey. You had the Passover, which was deliverance. It was a judgment on Egypt, which is a type of the world. And then you have, and that delivers Israel into the wilderness, which I believe connects to the holy place is the wilderness read pray and obey because he says how long how long will you disobey how long will you not obey my words and then you see the holy holy of holies I believe to be the promised land parallel to the promised land we and we read it in first Corinthians 10 well we hear read in 1 Corinthians 10 uh, 
verse 11. Now these things happen to them as an example that they're, they were written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the age have come. Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. No temptation has overtaken you but such as is common to man. And God is faithful who is, will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But all these things that happen were an example. You read further back in that t in chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians. It says, uh, For I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers were all under a cloud and all passed through the sea. What's the sea? Perhaps the outer court is the sea, I believe. You know, baptism is part of that. Uh, passed through the sea. And all were baptized in, into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. For they were eating and drinking from a spiritual rock which, is, which followed them. And the rock was Christ. So there you see Christ still applies. And the blood applied to the door protects us from judgment. It's the, it, it's, but being in the inner court is important and that's where repentance come in, comes in as I talked about. Uh, with most of them God was not pleased. Then we read in verse 6. Now these things happened as an example for us so that we would not crave evil things as they also craved. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. It, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drank and drink and stood up to play. Nor let us act immorally as some of them did and 23,000 fell in one day. Nor let us try the Lord as some of them did, and were destroyed by the serpent, nor grumble as some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroyer. And then that's where it comes up to the things that I said. And then it talks about fleeing immorality, verse 14 on. Flee immorality, and uh, is uh, not the cup of blessing. You know, that's of the Seder. Cup of blessing. And not the bread which... Is not the bread which we break a sharing in the body of Christ? Since there is one bread, we who are many are one body. For we are all... We, we all partake of the one bread. Look at the nation of Israel are not those who eat the sacrificial shares in the altar? What do I mean, then? That the thing sacrificed to idols isn't anything? or Doesn't want us to become shares in demons? All things are lawful, but are not all things are profitable. You read that in verse 23. And, you know, not being a stumbling block to our brothers and sisters. That's so important. That, that teaches us that that's all an example. And, and their time in the wilderness, I believe, is like our time. Whether, are we going to be in the, the holy place? Read, pray, obey? and grow from that and be blessed by that or not? Are we going to apply uh, Psalm 19 where it says, Psalm 119 starting in verse 7 I believe it is. The law of the Lord is perfect restoring the soul. The testimony of 
The Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true. They are righteous altogether. They are more desirable than gold. Yes, than much fine gold. Sweeter also <laughs> than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned. In keeping them there is great reward. This is talking about the law <laughs> and the instructions. By the, keeping them there is reward. And what is the reward? Well, let's go to Isaiah 33, where it says, talks about who is able to live with consuming fire, right? It says in verse 14 of, well, verse 11, it's part of it says, the latter part of it says, my breath will consume you like fire. But let's go down to verse 14. Sinners in Zion are terrified. Trembling has seized the godless. Who among us can live with the consuming fire? Who among us can live with continual burning? They wouldn't be asking those questions if that wasn't possible. He, he who walks righteously and speaks with sincerity, he who rejects unjust gain and shakes his hand, to so that they hold no bribe he who stops his ears from hearing about bloodshed and and shuts his mouth from looking upon evil or shuts his eyes from looking upon evil those that's your answer there how do we do that we are in the the holy place read pray obey read pray obey And like I mentioned in Acts 5.32, it talks about we are, we are witnesses to these things by the Holy Spirit whom he has given to those who obey him. And Hebrews 5.9, which says he is salvation to those who obey him. These concepts, that's what the holy place is all about is learning obedience like he like Yeshua like got Yahweh said how long will you not will you disobey me and there is real consequences to not being in the holy place let's you can read in Micah you read in Micah Chapter 4, Ezekiel, all the abominations there. Oh, well, hey, since I'm here, I'll go to Hosea 4, 6. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, because you have rejected knowledge. I also will reject you from being my priest. We are called a nation of kings and priests according to Peter. Since you have forgotten the law of your God, I also will forget your children. Okay, this is important to understand. But we read in Micah, well actually let's go to Zechariah. Uh, 22 so many pe so many peoples and mighty nations will come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to entreat the favor of the Lord thus says the Lord of hosts in those days ten men from all the nations will grasp the garment of a Jew saying let us go with you and we have heard that God is with you what while we're here let's go to 
Zechariah 14, when it talks about the holy days, specifically the Feast of Booths. Uh, verse 16, Zechariah 14, verse 16. Then I will, then it will come about that any who are left of all the nations that went up against Jerusalem will go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to celebrate the Feast of Booths. And it will be that whichever of the families of the earth does not go up to Jerusalem for worship, uh, to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, will, there will be no rain on them. Well, no rain means no crops, no food. If the family of Egypt does not go up to in or enter, then no rain will fall on them. It will be the plague that with which the Lord smites the nations who do not go up to celebrate the Feast of Booths. This will be the punishment of Egypt. There we go with Egypt again. As you saw in when I was talking about the Passover and the, what happened, the deliverance. They go through all the plagues as part of Passover in Jewish circles, Messianic circles. They, they go through all that and, and how Israel was delivered. This will be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of the nations who do not go up to celebrate the Feast of Booths. In that day there will be inscribed on the bells of horses, holy to the Lord, and the cooking pots in the Lord's house will be like the bowls before the altar. There again you see that's tabernacle language, temple language. Every cooking pot in Jerusalem and in Judah will be holy to the Lord of the host, and all who sacrifice will come take of them and boil in them and there will be, no longer be a Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts in that day and you know you read in uh, here in Joel 2.28 see that's all about judgment and you know they won't have water but here's in Joel uh, it will come about, this is verse 20, starting verse 28, and it will come about after this, pour out my spirit upon mankind, all mankind, and your sons and daughters will prophesy, and your old men will dream dreams, and your young men will see visions, On the uh, even on the male and female servants I will pour out my spirit, pouring as an anointing, which to you know which is important how did the how did the high priest refill the menorah he poured in the oil into the menorah into the lamps on the menorah so important the oil is what keeps it, the oil of the holy spirit is what keeps us from burning Malachi. Malachi is the one I'm thinking of, not which is the last one in the book. Malachi, not Micah. Malachi 4, verse 1. Behold, the days are day is coming, burning like a furnace, and all the arrogant and every evil doer will be chaffed, and the day that is coming will set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, my character, the Son of Righteousness, S-U-N, Son of right, Righteousness will rise in healing in its wings, and you will go forth and skip about like calves from the stall. You will tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under your feet, uh, uh, under the soles of your feet, on the day which 
I am preparing, says the Lord of hosts. Remember the law of Moses, my servant, even the statutes and ordinances which I commanded him at Horeb for all Israel. What does Hebrew, uh, what does uh, Romans 11 talk about? All of Israel will be saved. That's why the whole holy place is so important. Read, pray, and obey is so important. Protection from judgment. Just like Noah's in the ark, so are we. If we will read, pray, and obey. Behold, uh, behold, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. He will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, so that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. That's why we need to be in the inner court. The wicked become ashes. It makes it very clear. And we read in, but we re also read in Isaiah 30, who is able to live with consuming fire? Who is able to live with continual burning? That exists there for a reason. Those things are there for a reason. You can read the parable of the, the ten virgins. Five wise, five foolish. They don't. Some have the oil, some don't. If you don't have oil, which is the Holy Spirit, which you gain from obedience, you're going to have problems. You know, you read about the ten virgins in terms of uh, in uh, Matthew 25. And those who were ready went in. This is verse 10. And while they were going away to make the purchase and the the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with them to the wedding feast, and the door was shut. Later the, the other virgins also came, saying, Lord, Lord, open up for us. But he answered, Truly, truly, I, truly I say to you, I do not know you. Be on the alert then, for you do not know the day nor the hour. Yeah, you don't know when. Yom Teruah, Feast of Trumpets, will come about. And you read in Matthew 7, where it says, many will say, you know, Lord, Lord. It says in verse, uh, and you also see that it's got a cross-reference of Luke 6.46. Uh, but in Matthew 7, verse 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. You who practice lawlessness, pluralistness. You know, first first John three First John three makes it clear. First John three four says Everyone who practices sin practices lawlessness. What did we read? You who practice lawlessness, go away. Practice lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. What is sin? Transgression of the law. That's why we have to abide in Him. And that's what the whole inner court is about. Is abiding in Him. Learning His ways. Being His people. That's what we're here for. Loving, showing the love to one another, inviting others by our love into the inner court. That's why we're here. That's the whole point. And just as, and we can choose, like it was with Rebecca and Eliezer. Eliezer asked, and this is in Genesis, Eliezer was getting a, uh, was going back to Ur, 
which was where Abraham came from to get a bride. And what does he do? He goes to Ur and he says, the, the one who draws for me and so, uh, says, oh, I will draw for all your camels and every, everyone with you. That is the one who was his. And that's the whole thing. And then he asked her about marriage to, to his master. And they end up going across the desert to he Eleazar read, leads Rebecca from that from her home to in, uh, to go marry Isaac. That's that's by does that shows us how the Holy Spirit leads us. That's what the inner court is about is leading us to the wedding. After we say yes with to Yeshua, we repent, and repentance is turning away from the sin. Like Second uh, Chronicles seven fourteen says, "If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, then I and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will heal their land." But we have to turn away from our wicked ways, and that is a key. That is very key in all this. We, that's, and it is in those things. It's not that we're saved by, we're, by, we're saved by the works of the law. We're not. We can't be. We can't enter through that veil with, because <laughs> Yeshua is that veil. And that's, that's the important part. Yeshua is that veil that protects us from judgment. It's not that we can work our way to, to heaven. We can't. But through that, you know, through the tabernacle is the restoration of all things. That's what the tabernacle is all about. He wants a, a relationship with us. And I will do a part two on all this, where I will cover a lot of this more in depth. There's so many more, th there's other things to add to this. So, shalom, shalom, and we will see you in the next portion of this. Shalom, shalom. Now that I've kind of laid a foundation as to what the tabernacle is, about how the outer court is judgment, the inner court is the read, pray, obey, sanctification, and holy of holies is glorification in the promised land, and the outer court is the sea, could be related to the sea, and then the inner court is related to is the land where the temple is built and what you know outer court is important yes but inner court is where Israel is that's what defines Israel versus the rest of the world you know uh, we can read in John 15 all about abiding in the vine and go into First John about abiding. I've covered that in another DVD about grafted in, consuming fire, anointing, uh, and a lot of this stuff overlaps. But what defines Israel? Torah defines Israel. Read, pray, and, and as we read, we pray and we obey. And people will constantly say, Oh, well, are you going to sacrifice? Well, first of all, you can't sacrifice without a temple. And guess what? The temple wasn't built. If you go back and read First and Second Samuel, especially Second Samuel and First Kings, the temple was not built until Solomon. David was the one that battled on and on and on and on fighting enemies all over the place. Saul too. They were fighting enemies and it wasn't until Solomon 
that the temple could actually be built. Plus, it had to do with uh, with David's sin, I'm sure, with Bathsheba and all what happened with Absalom and Ammon, Absalom, Tamar, all that drama that happened in there and the sinfulness there, Bathsheba and all the sinfulness there. Uh, but you can't, they weren't going to build the temple until the enemies were crushed. What happened with Nehemiah, Ezra and Nehemiah? They were trying to rebuild and they were being fought all the time. They had to, they had to rebuild the, the city walls with swords on them. Always being ready to be on guard. Uh, be ready to fight because of the enemies that didn't want the temple and Jerusalem to be rebuilt. Um, so, you know, the enemies were put at bay, the sea at bay, so to speak, and then the temple could be built. One of the things we see with all of the, the Torah is we pass through the outer court on our way to the inner court. We pass through, but we can't go through the outer court and get through the outer court judgments without Yeshua. Without Yeshua, there is no entering the inner court. Inner court. And one of the things we need to realize is outer court is a lot of religion. Inner court is lifestyle. Religion is rebellion and, and all that kind of stuff, and it will be dealt with. As much as the tentacle represents, as, as much as the outer court represents baptism with the labor, you know, cleaning that and... and how mik how important mikvah or mikvahs were basically you know washing where they constantly talked about washing you had the the and it represented that but it also represents a judgment like what happened with Noah <laughs> that was the first time that the outer court was cleansed the second time it will be cleansed with fire. When Yeshua returns, he will return as a consuming fire. I believe that's what you see in Second Peter 3, where the elements burn with intense heat. Well, why? Because Yahweh is a consuming fire. And so will so is the sun, because it says he was equal with he was equal with God. It doesn't say necessarily that he is God, but it says equality with God. He, is, he didn't consider equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself and came down here to be, be a sacrifice. And we can't trample on the blood of Yeshua, Jesus, by thinking we can live any way we want. Yeshua isn't a get out of hell free card. And we can read in in uh, Ezekiel 18 Ezekiel 18 Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel Ezekiel, Daniel so, before Daniel and after Jeremiah and Lamentations, Ezekiel 18. And here's how we, we really get away from this once saved, always saved. That you can't stay in, and this kind of would tell you, you can't stay in the outer court. Keep out offering sacrifices and offering sacrifices applying the blood yes but he wants you to go beyond that he otherwise we trample the blood of Yeshua 
We'll start in Ezekiel 18, verse 20. The person who sins will die. The son will not bear the punishment for the father's iniquities, nor will the father bear the punishments for the son's iniquity. The righteousness of the righteous will be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked will be upon himself. If the wicked man turns from all his sins which he has committed, and observes all my statutes and practices, and practices justice and righteousness, he shall surely live. He shall not die. All his transgressions which he has committed will not be re uh, remembered against him because of his righteousness which he has practiced. He will live. And notice, turning from his sin, a, a, but if a wicked man turns from his sin, his, all his sins, that's what teshuva, that's what repentance is all about. He should, and then let's go on to 20, verse 22. All his transgressions which he has committed will not be remembered against him because of his righteousness which he has practiced. He will live. Do I... Do I have any pleasure in the death of the wicked to cause the Lord God? Rather than that he should turn from his ways and live? But when a righteous man turns away from his righteousness, commits iniquity, and does according to all the abominations that a wicked man does, will he live? All his righteous deeds which he has done will not be remembered for his treachery which he has committed and his sin which he has committed. For them he will die. And then it go talks about the way the Lord, you know, you say these things. And that. Let's go down to verse 30. Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, each according to his conduct towards the Lord God. Repent and turn away from all your transgressions so that so that iniquity may not become a stumbling block to you. Cast away from from you all your transgressions which you have committed and make yourself a new heart and a new spirit. For while what, uh, why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone who dies, declares the Lord. Therefore repent and live. Let's go to back to uh, some of the parts of Second Peter that I hadn't covered last time in the last video. Let's start at the beginning of chapter 3 of Second Peter. Well, actually, let's start in verse 21. For it would be better, verse 21 of, of chapter 2, for it would be better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn away from the holy command handed to them. It has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to its own vomit, and a sow after washing returns blowing in the myrrh. Then we start chapter 3. This, this is now, beloved, the second letter I am writing to you in which I am <laughs> stirring up your sen sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and the Savior spoken by your apostles. Know this first of all, that in the last days mockers will come with their mocking, following their own, way, own lust, 
what do we do a lot of times that that's why <laughs> teshuva by by teshuva by repentance we enter the holy pl the holy place and it helps solve this problem that's part of the 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 fight between the flesh and the spirit the the outer court is flesh the inner court is spirit and there's a constant fight there for us i think we don't always do the things that we should that's what Yeshua's blood is there for but we we seek to be in the inner court more and more and more he was for since our fathers fell asleep all con continues just as it was but from the beginning of creation verse 5 when I for when they maintain this it escapes their notice that by the word of God the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and, and by water through which the world at that time was destroyed being flooded with water that's kind of under you know boundaries were not it did not exist or, or were removed during the flood and many other things or, or in the very beginning from what I've heard bear a sheet which is the first word of Genesis <laughs> which is where Genesis gets its name in the Hebrew is bear a sheet it says a beginning not the beginning a beginning but by his word that okay verse 7 but by his word the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire kept for the day of judgment and destruction of, of ungodly men but do not let this one fact escape you escape your notice beloved that with the Lord one day is a thousand like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day the Lord is not so about his purposes as some count slowness but is patient toward you not wishing for any to perish but for all to come to repentance you know that's the entering the inner court repentance is all about entering the inner court and, and choosing to follow his ways not not committing the same things over and over and over again not blaspheming the Holy Spirit by that perish from but the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heaven will pass away and that's where you know at one point he talks about Noah you know while Noah was building the ark God was patient waiting for Noah to build the ark that took time uh, But it, the our ark at this day and time is the inner court. And how do we live in the inner court? Well, one thing is the Sabbath. Exodus, we read in Exodus 31, verse, starting in verse 12, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, But as for you, speak to the sons of Israel, saying, You shall surely observe my Sabbath, for this is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you there therefore you are to observe the Sabbath for it is holy to you everyone who profanes it surely to, it shall surely be put to death for whoever does any work on it that person shall be cut off from among his people for six days Day's work may be done, but on the seventh day there is a Sabbath of complete rest. Holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day shall surely be put to death. So the sons of Israel shall observe the Sabbath to celebrate the Sabbath throughout their generations. The sons of Israel. Well, if we're grafted in, then aren't we sons of Israel? That's what one of the why where the Sabbath matters as opposed to Sunday. Sunday, I can sh show from the uh, Catholic Catechism that it, 
they did it by their own authority, changing it from Saturday to Sunday. What they thought they had the authority to do. Okay, verse 17. It is a sign between me and the sons of Israel forever. For six days the Lord for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, but on the seventh day he ceased from his labor and was refreshed. When he had finished speaking to him upon Sinai, he gave Moses two tablets, you know, and of course then you have the golden calf and all that stuff. Then let's go to Exodus 34, which is also about the Sabbath. Uh, and not all of it, but from verse 21. Uh, you know, it earlier it talks about the Feast of Unleavened Bread. At, you know, one of Yahweh's appointed times, Moedim. But uh, so is the Sabbath. And you re realize it was from creation that he, he established the Sabbath. Uh, from Genesis, he rested on the Sabbath and blessed the seventh day and rested in it. Uh, 21, verse 21 of Exodus 34. You shall work six days, but on the seventh day you shall rest. Even during plowing time and harvest you shall rest. You shall celebrate the Feast of Weeks, that is, the first fruits of the wheat harvest, and the Feast of Ingathering at the turn of the year. Three times a year, all your males are to appear before the Lord, God, the God of Israel. For I will drive out the nations before you and enlarge your boundaries, and no man shall covet your land. When you go up three times a year to appear before the Lord, your, your God, you shall not offer the blood of my sacrifices with leavened bread, nor the sacrifice of the feast of Passover to, the, to be left over until morning. You shall bring the very first fruits of your soil into the house. <coughs> let's not forget, let, let, let's also look at this as these holy days are about the harvest, the feast of weeks, the beginning of the wheat harvest, the first fruits during unleavened bread is the beginning of the, the barley harvest. The feast of Sukkot is the feast of ingathering, and it's not by accident that the temple was built on a threshing floor, I'm sure. There's significance to that. Let's go <laughs> on the Sabbath thing. We'll go to uh, Isaiah 56 because it talks about not profaning the Sabbath. Isaiah 56. We'll go to Isaiah 56 and Isaiah 58. Uh, Isaiah 56, starting in verse 1. Thus says the Lord, you know, Yahweh, Preserve justice and do righteousness. For my salvation is about to come and my righteousness to be revealed. How blessed is the man who does this and the son of a man who takes hold of it who keeps from profaning the Sabbath and keeps his hand from doing any evil. Let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, The Lord will surely separate me from his people. Nor let the, nor let the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. The whole thing of the eunuch was, they were, uh, those that had crushed testicles were not allowed in to the congregation which is so, so that shows you he, this is kind of a grace thing in, in some ways about but keeping Sabbath the, uh, here with the eunuch it takes all it. and let no foreigner not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say Lord surely the foreigner who's joined him, joined to the Lord. How, that goes back to Numbers 15, where it says, 
There will be one law for you and for the alien who she joins with you. But, okay, so we'll go verse 4 here. For thus says the Lord to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbath and choose what pleases me and hold fast my covenant. To them I will give in, in my house and within my walls a memorial and a name better than that of sons and daughters. How can you come with a better name than sons and daughters? I will give them an everlasting name which is not will, will not be cut off. Also the foreigner who joins himself to the Lord to minister to him and, and to love the name of the Lord, the character of the Lord, to be his everyone who keeps from profaning the Sabbath and holds fast my covenant. Even those I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be acceptable on my altar. Their burnt offerings will be and stuff will be uh, acceptable. Wow. Isn't that amazing? That That's a, a very interesting thing. Let's go to Isaiah 58, verse 13. If because of the Sabbath you turn your foot from doing your own pleasure on my holy day and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord, honorable, and honor it, this test... Uh, desisting from your own ways from seeking your own pleasure and s speaking your own word then I will tell take the light in the Lord then you will take the light in the Lord and I will make you right on the heights of the earth and I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father for the mouth of Lord has spoken and we look at numbers 15 where it talks about the whole thing of there being one law for for the alien and for the sojourner verse uh, 15 numbers 15 verse 15 as for the assembly there shall be one statute for you and for the alien who joins with you a perpetual statute throughout your generations. As you are, so shall the alien be before the Lord. There is to be one law and one statute for you and for the alien who joins with you. And why is this important? Because we, I mean, that gives, that shows you we can be joined to him. We can be grafted in. That concept came in. But why is that important? You know, the parable of the wheat and the tares, the, the wheat, which Pentecost and the wheat harvest go together, which should make some, some uh, hopefully put on off some light bulbs in your head about the, the a feast of the, the beginning of ingathering of the wheat and the parable of the wheat and the tares. The wheat is gathered into the barn, the tares are burned, and it's a parable of those who obey versus those who disobey. Uh, I think that's important. And then you, why is the, but why is all this important to understand of uh, these two? And for that we go to 1 Corinthians 6. Verse 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous will that that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor adulterers, nor I mean idolaters, nor adulterers, nor Im infinite, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor covetousness, nor drunkard, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Such were some of you, but 
but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, in the spirit of our Lord Christ. All things are, uh, but then we go here, skip a few verses, because it talks about, you know, the food, the stomach is for food, food is for the stomach and the stomach for food, but those things will be done away with. God will do away with both of them, yet the body is not for immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body. Now God has, in not only raise the, the Lord, but will also raise us up through his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take away the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? May it never be. Or do you not know that the one who joins himself to a prostitute is one body with her? For he says, the two shall become one flesh, but the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee immorality, every other sin that a man commits is outside the body, but the immoral man sins against his own body. Or do you not know that the, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have from God? and that you are not your, your own, for you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. So we see that so important. He can't be Yeshua, Jesus can't be one, can't become one flesh with sinful man. That's why we have to be cleansed, we have to be sanctified, which is what the Holy Spirit is there for. Read John 16. Um, and one of the things we have to realize is the inner court is religion. The inner court is lifestyle. The, the people that came into the outer court to bring sacrifices, they only did that, you know, maybe once a week, once a month, whatever it was. Whenever they committed sin, they would come in and they would have their animal. But the priest, it was a lifestyle for them. And the, the tabernacle is about all things and, and we are called a nation of kings and priests according to Peter uh, we are called a nation of kings and priests that we are a na nation of kings and priests a royal priesthood uh, second Peter oh that's a, that's the thing about Noah Uh, it's in First Peter. Yeah, First Peter uh, eight and the stone of stumbling, verse eight, starting in verse eight. The stone of stumbling and the rock of offense, for they stumble because they are disobedient to the word, and to this doom they they were also appointed but you as a you are a chosen race a royal priesthood a holy nation people for God's own possession so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light well what was the inner court it had the menorah what a marvelous light for you once were not a people but now you are a people of God you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And then it talks uh, uh, about abstain from fleshly lust, which wage war against the world, keeping your behavior excellent among the Gentiles. What are Gentiles? Non-believers. Uh, because of your good... They may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God in the days of visitation. So that's the whole point, and that's the 
whole point of lifestyle. That's what this is all about. You know? This this reminds me of being wrapped with Christ. It helps me in my prayer life. That's what this is about. The the zit seats, the the talit, the beard. The beard is a symbol of my desire to live a covenant lifestyle. The uh, the zit seats that are for women, head covering, modesty, those sorts of things. Those are part of lifestyle and we we're a nation of kings and priests so this should be a lifestyle for us uh, that we receive the Holy Spirit so we can be in the presence of the consuming fire uh, and you know make fun, and be have put on the new self that's the whole thing of being in the inner court and also the point of the burnt offering uh, you know, the feast are all about the wedding. Yeah, the the you have the wedding contract, the the betrothal, the bread and the wine, and like Christ says, I stand at the door and knock, and whoever whoever answers, I dine with them. That's in Revelation two or three. Uh, and the temple and tabernacle is about rest restoration of all things. And this is all about his way of restoring. Uh, restoring us. And let's push on to spiritual maturity. Hebrews 6 talks about push on to spiritual maturity, not laying the same foundation. The outer court given to the Gentiles because they're not of his. Uh, and we must put on immortality. This is a fleshly tent. And we are a temple of the Holy Spirit. That's why we do the things we do. That's why we don't eat pork and shellfish and these things. It's because we are temples of the Holy Spirit. That's what that all that stuff is a reminder of. The separating of seeds and all that stuff or quarantine for leprosy and all this kind of thing is separating the holy and the profane to teach us the separation of the holy and profane. That's what Torah is about. And about showing love to others. You know, putting up parapets and all that kind of stuff. It was all about protecting people. And the veils represent the first coming and the second coming. First coming we get access to the holy place. The, the second coming, we, that's where we can are confessed before the Father by Yeshua and he says I will confess those those who deny me before men I will deny before the Father those who I who confess me will conf, I will confess before the Father to me we, we we confess or deny him by the lifestyle that we live we call ourselves believers and yet don't live don't don't get into the inner court and live and show love compassion for people and all this what are we doing what good is it so that's the whole point of this whole thing is knowing that judgment is in the outer court we have access to the inner court through repentance we enter through the veil that is Yeshua and we were protected just like they were protected at Passover by the blood on the doorpost. He passed over them. Just like Revelation says, he will put a mark on our forehead, our frontal lobe, before the wrath comes. There's so much we could study. And Revelation is all about temple language. The, the beginning is all about temple language. Temple and tabernacle is... is the most important part of scripture because it tells you about Yeshua and your need for a savior let's not reject this stuff let's let's seek this let's be better people let's live the lifestyle that he called us to live let's be lights unto him 
unto the nation <laughs> through the Torah. That's what the, you know, lamps don't do it. It's the oil that keeps us from burning. Keeps us, I mean, I mean, it's the oil that keeps us burning without being consumed. So hopefully this is helpful. Hopefully this is a expl good explanation for these things. And I just hope that this is a blessing to you. Shalom, shalom. May Yahweh bless and keep you and make his face shine upon you. Be gracious unto you and give you peace. I want to. talk about being the temple of the Holy Spirit because that's also what what this whole thing of the temple and tabernacle is about don't forget that the temple was in the mid, in the center of the congregation and that the congregation was laid out in such a way to look like a body I think people will say it's cross I think it's talking about the body and what is what is at our center the center mass of our body the heart the heart the lungs all those things but the heart the heart pumps the blood the blood is the life of the animal it's what carries nutrients to the rest of the body it's what uh, does all sorts of things the, the life is in the blood which is so critical for us to understand and that why is the law being written upon our heart because it cleanses the rest of the body and Torah is what that's what Torah is about it's about restoration it's about getting us back to where Adam was before the fall where he walked with God that's what this is all about is getting back to to that and we read here in Second Timothy, uh, you know, <laughs> it <laughs> talks about the end times and what, how people will be, which you could read that, you know, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, etc. And it goes on and on and on, listing all sorts of things that bad things that people do. But then we have verse five holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. Avoid such men as these, for among <coughs> them are those who enter into households and captivate weak women, weighed down with sins, led on by various impulses, always learning and never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. Well, what is truth? Truth is Torah. And then we read further, and then it talks about a couple of people opposed Moses. So these men also opposed the truth. Men of depraved mind re rejected in regard to the faith. Rejecting truth. Op opposing truth. Tr opposing Torah. Because Torah is cleansing for us. I mean, it really is. Where we, we think of others more important to ourselves. That's what the whole thing thing about Torah is about you know not letting your your cattle go and graze on someone else's land is one of the things in the Torah to that they graze your land bare and then they go over to someone else's you have to make <laughs> restitution for that that the best that someone can graze on your land the best of your grass as part of restitution and you know, building a parapet so that no one will fall off the roof because they had, they were able to walk on the roofs at that time and they put a parapet so no one would fall off. That's a love thing. A love for others. That's how we build <laughs> this temple is, is through love. Love for one another and love for God. Love for God in the, in having a love for his holy days the Sabbath and his holy days showing love for this temple in 
not eating unclean animals, not not watching uh, movies that that'll tinker around in here that you don't want them. You don't that just like TVs, they call it TV programming for a reason. Anton LaVey called the TV the family altar. We have to watch what goes into this temple. That's the purpose of this whole. <laughs> To, uh, what could and couldn't be part of the temple? What uh, the keeping the quarantines about the uh, <coughs> <coughs> those with leprosy or women that were in their menstrual period or I mean the list goes on and on and on about what people that have touched dead people dead people or people that touch carcasses of dead animals, especially unclean animals. I mean, the list goes on and on and on about what, how to, uh, about purity. That's the whole point of the, the keeping the, not, not ha mixing wool and linen together or, or not mixing two types of seed or not, uh, breeding two types of cattle together <laughs> all these sorts of things are all all to teach us how to separate the holy and the profane the holy days are to teach us about are, are to keep our keep our eyes on Yeshua as, a, as the bridegroom the Passover which we keep accepting taking part in, in Yeshua's sacrifice through Passover. Symbolically, we partake of him just as the priest partook of, had their part in the sacrifices, <laughs> things that were sacrificed. We have that. And, and doing things for others, thinking of, of others is more important than ourselves. That's what the that's one of the things that Paul talks about several times within Scripture. And we can read in Corinthians where Paul talks about us being the temple of the Holy Spirit. We go to 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 3. Uh, Verse sixteen. Do you not do you not know that you are a temple of, of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If any man destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, and that is what you are. That's why it's so important. And he goes on to talk about uh you know, worldly wisdom and and those sorts of things. And then you go to 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19. Do you, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who <coughs> is in you, whom you have from God? Uh and you are not your own, for you have been bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body. And like it talks about earlier, that he can't make us, that, that we become one flesh. Verse 18 talks about flea immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body. Immorality, the man sins against his own body. And that we are to be members of Christ. And we cannot become one with Christ. Like he says over in verse 15. Do, not, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then all take away the member, members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? May it never be. Or do you not know that? Or do you not know that 
the one who joins himself to a prostitute is one body with her. For he says, the two shall become one flesh. That's why adultery was such a big sin. Because it, yes, against the husband or wife or whatever, but it was a, it was marriage is to show our relationship to Yeshua. Uh, let's go to Second Corinthians, chapter six, verse sixteen. We start in 16. Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are a temple of the living God, just as God said. I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord, and do not touch what is unclean. That's the whole point of getting into the inner court of the tabernacle. Read, pray, obey. And we we need to really get at that point. It's there's so much peace and so much cleansing by being by by Treating ourselves as a temple of the Holy Spirit, having respect for ourselves with modesty and 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 head covering being a protection for women, especially. And I've heard about it being a helpful for men to not have certain nightmares if they've been into the occult or they've been into different things. If they wear a skull cap at night, especially that they don't have the nightmares and the flashbacks and that kind of stuff. It has a purpose. The beard is a symbol of covenant. It was a symbol, it was sh You can read about David's men, a couple of places where their beards were shaved off and they, they were, it was a way of shaming them. We're, we're <laughs> because that culture especially was an honor and shame culture. You know, that that's where honor your father and mother takes on a whole new perspective. Um, Paul says in, in Romans 12, Present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. And there's scripture that says, whatever is good, whatever is... Uh, where Paul was talking about, set your, set your mind on the things of the spirit, not on the things of the flesh. And he talks about, others being more important than ourselves. And he talks about having a circumcision of the heart. That's what the whole point of being in the inner court is about, is being at, as temples of the Holy Spirit. We become set apart, and the lamp that we are to be grows. The brightness of the lamp grows in us as we live according to the Torah. You can read uh, about in Luke 11 verse 33 it says no one after lighting a lamp puts it away in a cellar nor under a basket but on the lampstand so those who enter uh, may see the light, the light, the the eye is the lamp of the, your body. When your eye is clear, your whole body also is full of light. That's, that's what Torah is about, is fill us with light, fill us with love for others. That's how we are light. Read, pray, obey. And keeping the holy days, like I mentioned, is all about keeping our focus on the bride.
uh, on the bridegroom uh, about who we are to be married to. Passover is about renewing our vows to Yahweh and partaking of Yeshua who symbolically just like the priest partook of the sacrifices we partake and become <laughs> with we, we bec uh, <laughs> become part of Christ that's why the whole thing not eating meat sacrificed to idols was so important back then uh, and then it, and and to be a light the light is Torah in the beginning was the word the Torah and the Torah <laughs> in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God the Torah was God and the word became flesh the Torah became flesh well how did what does that mean you you can read Leviticus and and see what that means the first five five or six chapters of Leviticus are all about the uh, sacrificial system which is a grace system you read it you can read about in, in Exodus about the garments of the priest they wore tunics specially worn tunics and they you had the like the the blue purple and red blue represented royalty a lot maybe that's where what the whole thing of royal blue came from but you have blue you have purple which is a combination of the blue and the red blue and red makes purple and then red red being may, maybe symbolic of sin and when you're in the and maybe in some way it represents you know the being in the outer court is sin uh, represents sin being in the inner court is the pulp purple and then being in the holy of holies is where the royalty like it's like Peter says we are a nation of kings and priests and that's the whole point of this Israel was to be a nation of kings and priests to the rest of the world why the point is to show people Messiah to bring them into a relationship to restore them you know relationship is where you get restored not it's not about going to church once or twice a week or whatever that's not where you get restored it's in the lifestyle what you partake in your body Leviticus 20, 11 talks about clean and unclean animals why clean and you know what is okay to eat and what isn't and it's also in Deuteronomy 14 there's two witnesses to that then the Leviticus 23 talks about these are the feast of Yahweh, not the feast of the Jews, the, the feast of Yahweh. Passover was the betrothal, the, the Pe Pentecost or Shavuot, feast of weeks, represented when the Holy Spirit was given, he says, which in John 16, it says, I will send a helper that will confer, convict you for... Con concerning sin, concerning righteousness, and concerning judgment. And then he lists why those things. And John John uh, 15 talks about being abiding in Yeshua and Jesus. How? Repentance. I think that's part of what why the importance you have in Hebrews 5.9 is it's his salvation to those who obey him well how do we obey him Torah what was part of the Great Commission teach them what I have taught you that was part of the Great Commission teach and that's the whole point we're supposed to grow in holiness and in, in godliness showing love for one another <laughs> for our fellow man you read Exodus 
20, 21, 22, and 23. And it talks about different things about how you treat your neighbors. That you it, you don't leave an open pit for an animal to fall into. I mean, you don't let a an ox gore someone. There's there's things for that. There's there's things about in Leviticus about sexual morality. There's Exodus 23, uh, verse 14, talking about three times a year you shall celebrate the feast to, a feast to me. You shall observe the, the feast of unleavened bread for seven days. You shall eat unleavened bread as I command you. Appointed time in the month of Abib or Aviv, depending on how you look at it. And then it talks about the feast of first fruit, harvest of first fruits, and the feast of ingathering. These, are, why does he want you to celebrate harvest time? There's a reason for that. There's a reason why the temple was put upon a threshing floor. Why, why the temple mount was a threshing floor? It was separating the wheat and the chaff. And the the whole thing, Sabbath for the land, and and the jubilee, and and all those sorts of things, they have a purpose. Yeah, you know, we we see so much, and you you see so much in the stuff about how to treat your neighbor. You don't move their boundary markers. You don't do those sorts of things, but. And Yeshua even raised that bar about he who looks at a woman with lust has committed adultery already. Or where, and you know, the, the paralytic, he said, go and sin no more that something worse may happen to you. So that something worse does not happen to you. He tells the, the woman caught in adultery Go and sin no more. Yes, he he's he was he, Yeshua represented grace, but grace isn't a license to sin. When you decide that this book matters and and following his instructions and seeing the principles behind this book, which is all about love and a restoration of all things. That's what this book is about, is the restoration of all things from beginning to end. Why did the flood happen? To restore re, to restore the, the world at the time. Why is why is God a consuming fire? Because he will restore the world by by cleansing of all the the sinfulness. That was supposed that's the what that's why being a temple of the Holy Spirit is so important as being a light on this earth. You might look at it as we are light like the moon is light until the sun comes. Because the righteous, it says there will be no need for a sun. For God's righteousness, God's glory will illuminate the whole world. You can read Genesis. There, for the first day or two, there was no sun. It wasn't created till day four, I believe it is. And you can look at how he was building a a house. At that point, he separated the the firmaments. He separated the one from the other, and then he and then he gathered the water into to seas so that the dry land could appear. He was building a temple at that point. But the cosmos is a temple. That's what he put it there for. He put the stars and stuff in the sky. Signs and seasons and and the the moon 
representing a month, you know, the cycle of the moon representing a month, all these sorts of things are there for a reason. So hopefully this is helpful <laughs> and help you to grow in your walk. You know, uh, Titus 1, verse, I believe it's 16, that says, we confess him, they confess him with their him as Lord, but with their deed by their deeds they deny him. And the temple needs to be right here. It needs to be. the temple is formed is by the law being written upon our heart. That's what the Holy Spirit was given for. Was to help us keep the ketubah, the, the marriage contract, the wedding contract. And then we, you know, little fall feast are about the when, when Yeshua returns again and consummates the marriage and and the wedding the wedding celebration and all those things. This has a purpose. So please search the scriptures and want seek to live it out. I've found great great blessing and, and, and embracing things like zit seats and, and having a beard and the, the different things. And it says in Zechariah, I believe it's 8, about Gentiles will, ten Gentiles will grab onto the zit seat garment of one Jew. That's what a zitzit looks like, just so you know. But all this stuff has a purpose. <laughs> Head covering has a spiritual, a spiritual protection, not just a physical. A lot of the things that the temple was to show us that fit, uh, spiritual concepts through a physical, through a physical creation, it was there to show us. The spiritual concepts so hopefully this is helpful and worth your time shalom shalom may Yahweh bless and keep you and make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you and give you peace